into me. Okay, so I'll uh, start with our title, uh, Women of Colour in Academia, Political Creativity and Impossibilities, Possibilities of Solidarity uh, panel. So welcome us all and welcome to the viewers, I guess. And so before we do begin, we'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country and then I'll briefly introduce myself and as others will after that. So we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the ICCP conference has been organized, the people of the Kulin Nation. We would like to pay our respects to elders, community members past and present and community members who are taking part in the conference. We'd also like to acknowledge the work of Mandani Bullock um, for their work, for their part in making this conference possible. We express solidarity with the ongoing struggle for land rights, self-determination, sovereignty, and the recognition of past injustices. We also express hope for reconciliation and justice for Australian, Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and for many other Indigenous communities across the world. So in today's uh, panel, we recognize that we have no Australian Indigenous women's voices, uh, and we hope to build bridges and develop existing relationships and, can, and work in solidarity towards decolonial futures in and through academia. Um, so uh, my name is Lutfia Ali, and I'm currently working as a research associate at Victoria University on a sessional basis. And my discipline background is in psychology, identify particularly within community psychology, like I, my uh, home is sort around that space. And my areas of research include social identity, community making, belonging among racialized ethnicized uh, identities at the intersections of particularly race and gender and other variants uh, within the context of Australian multicultural relations, which you know, is understood as you know, informed by continuing patterns of uh, race and uh, racism. So that's, yeah, and often I, in my work, I draw on uh, decolonial and third world feminism to shed light on dynamics of power, uh, plural subjectivities, and how we negotiate into subjective relationships. So that's just me briefly. So yeah, I'll put myself on silent. Shall I go next? Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Terika Bolatingidi. I'm a Fijian Australian artist and educator who produces multidisciplinary projects centering counter narrative of marginalized histories and knowledges through curatorial collaboration, uh, photography, video installation and publication. And I'm a lecturer in the School of Communication and Creative Arts at Deakin University, where I've taught photographic theory and practice for the past 14 years. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining from the uh, lands of the Kulin Nation. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, introduce myself as well. My name is uh, uh, Denise Chapman. I'm a lecturer at um, uh, Monash University. Um, my focus is on critical media literacies. Um, and so I have a love for children's literature um, and um, particularly uh, picture books that focus on um, a black protagonist um, and how we can use those books as spaces for engendering um, liberating dialogue uh, uh, with, um, with people. I also am a spoken word uh, artist and, um, and poet and um, enjoy using uh, um, that as a means for um, speaking about my experiences within the academy. Um, I am also joining you all um, on the lands of the Kulin Nation and would like to pay my respects and acknowledge um, those first peoples. Hi everyone, uh, I, as you can see, I'm by the sea, but uh, I'm looking at the sea actually. I'm on the lands of the Bunwarung people at Western Port, uh, southeast of Melbourne. Uh, my name is Ruth. I have a background in nursing, mental health nursing in particular, 
and I'm particularly interested in the concept of cultural safety and how institutions can be transformed so that they deliver uh, equitable, respectful, kind, caring healthcare to everybody. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to Māori nurses in Aotearoa, where I've spent a lot of my life for uh, developing this concept and for Iri Hapiti Ramsden for creating it as a korowai or cloak that would shelter other people as well. And uh, very excited about being a part of this conversation. Thank you. Shall I go next? <laughs> okay. okay, I'm Shakira Hussein. I am also living on the stolen land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I also spent significant period of my life, more my undergraduate and postgraduate studies were at the Australian National University on the stolen land of the Ngunnawal people. And I grew up in Queensland on the stolen land of the um, Kulin, of the Gubbi Gubbi. Um, and I'm at, at the University of Melbourne, where I'm an honorary research fellow. I'm based at the National Institute for Islamic Studies in the Asia Institute. And I will add that besides having a brown body, I also have a visibly disabled body. And the work of, and not just the work as in the published work, but also the work in terms of um, solidarity and mentoring and, um, you know, and educating that I've derived from disabled women has made me think more deeply about what it is to belong to non-normative bodies of various types. There is a racial hierarchy within disability community as well. White privilege doesn't go away just because you, your white body is in a wheelchair, you're still, of course, you know, intersectionality. You, um, it's different being a, a white person in a wheelchair still has a level of privilege that isn't extended to an indigenous person also in a wheelchair. But at the same time, I feel that I can have conversations with particularly very visibly disabled white women and men um, than with sometimes more than with non-disabled or able bods as um, the shorthand. Um, that, yeah, so that, those are also that I mention it because it has made me revisit a lot of the thoughts that I've had around race for a long time and it doesn't contradict them, but I think it extends them, which is why I raise it now. And, and also that's why I'm, an, well, the disabled body, I think is a large part of why I'm an honorary research fellow, AKA broke with no salary, but a library card, yay. Thank you so much for organizing this space. I am so grateful and honored to be joined by all of you. I am joining you from the land that belongs to the Ohlone and the Muwekma Ohlone. I am based in San Jose, California, and the Ohlone and Muwekma Ohlone are the rightful owners of the territory on which I stand, of which I am an uninvited occupant, uh, working to decolonize the various spaces of which I am um, located and how I am positioned. And my research broadly looks at um, how can we use and engage in decolonial feminist uh, epistemologies and how can these be combined with critical participatory action research approaches that are community centered and community grounded. I primarily work with uh, Latinx communities and young people who identify as black, indigenous, and or people of color. I am a Chicana. I was born in Mexico and raised in between the borderlands of Mexico, Michoacan, and the US here in California. So much of what I quote unquote research is really very much tethered to my own personal and lived experiences. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be in community with all of you. Thank you. Um, I have to say, Jessica, that I had blue corn tortillas with ancho chilies and nopales for breakfast. <laughs> that is, that is, that is a, you had the best breakfast that I haven't had in months because I, I missed my home, my, my country, my family. 
Thank you. I'll, I'll send you some pictures. <laughs> so, uh, so, solidarity through food. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we, so we plan to open up with a quote that we used in our abstract um, as a point of provocation or, um, yeah, to, to start generating dialogue and come into conversation about our experiences of being a woman of colour who navigates the borders of community and academia. So it's a quote by Gloria Anzaldúa, and it's from her chapter titled Haciendo Caras, uh, meaning making faces to put on face and express feelings by distorting the face. That's how I interpreted um, her title. And she writes, a woman of color who writes poetry or paints or dances or makes movies knows there is no escape from her from race or gender when she is writing or painting. She can't take off her color, her sex and leave them at the door of her study or studio, nor can she leave behind her history. Art is about identity among other things and her creativity is political. So yeah, I, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, having read that, I'll just leave it open to see, you know, how we come into conversation over that quote from Anzel Dua. I was, you know, what I, what I love about it, and I'd love to hear Jessica's thoughts about this, because, you know, structurally located uh, much more closely um, to, to that theory. Um, but, but I think about all those things that are seemingly neutral, but are deeply political. So I was thinking about care, which is something I'm profoundly interested in. And it sort of seems to be the big buzzword during COVID-19. You know, everyone's talking about, you know, and ethics of care. And, and uh, nurses, we, we tend to think we own care even though uh, Shakira, as you know, and we've talked about in the past that uh, health professionals are not necessarily caring, you know. Um, but I'm deeply interested in the things that seem politically neutral that are so politically charged like care, you know, the, the things that seem everyday, ordinary, um, institutional processes that are seemingly universal, but are laden with power relations. So I, I think that was a Beautiful quote to start with, Lute. You know, I, I have to agree. It, it's, it's interesting, um, as um, you were talking, Ruth, I kept thinking those things that aren't, are, are deemed, um, you know, not to be political and uh, that they're neutral in some way. And I keep going back to, in, in my area, picture books. Um, you know, here I am trying to um, engage in the faculty of education with um, and convince pre-service teachers about the power of, of this medium these, this media, if you will, and, um, and how it's, it's, it's important for them as, um, you know, people who are going to be working with a diverse group of, of children um, to be able to have an understanding of, of, of what types of media are they creating or opening up in their space for um, you know, the possibilities, the imagination of the children around them. Um, uh, how, you know, how this can be, I think, as you had put it, that um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a space that is political, but somehow children's books are viewed as, oh, it's just a children's book. It, it's not it's not political. Um, I'm, Bell Hooks would definitely disagree with that in her book, Happy to be Nappy. Um, there it is, uh, children's literature is a huge, um, I usually sing this strange song, so uh, excuse the, I can't believe I'm gonna be singing here, um, but I usually say children's literature, what is it good for? Absolutely everything. Right, and actually disrupting that that song in and of itself, but it uh, very often can be used as a counter narrative, a space for that. And and I think um, 
Uh, and many children's books are really poetry in and of itself. And poetry, we know um, uh, Audre Lorde talks about it as a way um, that poetry is a way we uh, help uh, give the name to the nameless so that it can be thought. Um, uh, and I think um, this is really, really important uh, it, because it engenders that space to be able to have these conversations that we really need. Thank you so much, Ruth and Denise, for sharing um, what resonated with you from that quote and really how the, the work that we do is, is very much personal and political and how these things are so interconnected um, and, and really disturbing and unsettling this notion of neutrality. I, I am an assistant professor in the ethnic studies department and my background is in social community psychology. And one of the things I share my with my students in this class, because we focus on a non-Eurocentric narrative of US history. And I tell my students, because initially when I was started to teach, they would say that I was biased, that I, my teaching was so biased, that I was un-American. And, and then with that feedback, I, I really take, took time in the first week of classes to say, there is no neutrality. And this notion of bias needs to be interrogated because my life, my body, my lived experience has always been political. I didn't know it was political, but I came to realize that it is. And so we need to interrogate, what do we mean by neutral? What do we mean by bias? What do we mean by political? And when we can understand what these words mean and then how they manifest to reproduce these layers of oppression, in ourselves, in our communities, then we can begin to do the work of healing, of transformative justice, of decolon decoloniality, of imagining some, some other uh, more humanizing, um, affirming world, community. So, so the work of Anzal Dua has always been very much close to my heart um, because I, I read her and I read her words in Spanish and I thought, wow, this is possible in academia. <laughs> and the reality is that yes, but it's gonna cost you and it's gonna hurt. Um, so thank you for bringing me back to those memories with that quote. Yeah, thanks a lot for putting that quote there. And, uh, and, and Jessica, you've just reminded me of that, you know, when talking about bias and, I remember being in a meeting with some colleagues uh, once and they said there's not enough dead white men in the curriculum, in the reading list. And I had spent so long, you know, making sure that the reading list, you know, it was, was diverse and inclusive. And this is the first year photography unit. And it was heartbreaking, but it made me more committed <laughs> to what I'm doing, you know. Um, and I think that in, in creative arts and visual arts, there's obviously no neutrality, but I've, you know, part of the thing that I've struggled with as an artist in, in educational spaces is this sense of um, my work, if it's about identity, that it's not valid, that it's not art. And this kind of, um, this reluctance from the institution to kind of see the nuances of the work, to read the work from that lived experience, to accept that, you know, that it is it is valid work, but just because it's about identity and it's political, that it has no place. So, yeah. So, but yeah, I've, I've always loved the work of Ansel Dewar as well. Yeah, thank you. If I come to this question of boundaries, I do a lot of, I publish a lot of creative nonfiction as well as the peer reviewed academic work and if I talk about it, frame it in terms of justifying that, I would say that my creative nonfiction has had a, a much higher impact than my academic publications. More people read it for a start. And I like being read, it turns out. I like being read by more than three academics and the, you know, and the, who did the peer review reports and maybe two people who turned to the journal. I like being able to have conversations about it. I like the fact that, that people contact me because they, that you know, I get emails from people who've who've read and been affected by 
the stuff that I publish in um, non-academic outlets. I like the stuff, the fact that it's much less likely to be stuck behind a paywall somewhere. And I like the connections that it's helped me to make with people outside academia, with writers outside academia, you know, with, um, with, with students, with emerging writers, with artists, with a much more diverse range of um, humanity and larger humanity of color as well. But it has also made me have to think more carefully about why we slot particular outputs, puts in particular categories, not just academic and non-academic. At the moment, I'm one of the judges for the Victorian Premier's Literary Awards. And without talking about the actual deliberations, what's been long-listed or short-listed, reading a large quantity, in fact, a very large quantity of recent Australian nonfiction has made me think my own concepts of what counts as literature and what isn't, and what counts as the sort of literature to which one might give an award and what is not worthy of that award. And um, yeah, and what ends up between covers and what doesn't. Because as I was reading these books, I was thinking, where's there's a book here, there, or books that I want to read and that I want to shortlist and, you know, and they're not there because they're not being published. And when I think of all the various particularly exciting Indigenous writers who, you know, who I want to shortlist, they're not here because they haven't published yet. And there's all kinds of barriers between them and the completion of, a, you know, of, of a full length book. They've published lots of, you know, media articles. They've published in some cases like chapters, essays, but not a full length book that I can say, this is the one, this is, you know, among the, if not the best book that was published in Australia last year. And, you know, um, that's the book I want to give the award to. And also the proportion of books, it, you know, I didn't have to be going through this exercise to know this, but the proportion of books, particularly about Indigenous writers as a po or Indigenous issues by, by white writers, as opposed to the, the proportion of books by them. And like, it's a slogan that I think was basically um, certainly taken up strongly within the disability community, but, you know, gets used within race as well. Nothing about us without us. Like, although these books on Indigenous issues by various settler writers, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have been written and I'm not saying that those writers shouldn't be, you know, receive a claim for their work, but there are structural reasons why a, 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 a white professor can write 100,000 words on, on Indigenous issues and an Aboriginal writer just doesn't have the time and space, everything that we know very well and yet still haven't managed to shift. I mean, and coming right back, you know, coming down to basic things like close the gap, the gap in life expectancy, the gap in health. And, you know, it's, as I know from the multiple cirrhosis, although the, I feel like multiple cirrhosis doesn't really count because um, there's a hell of a lot of um, white people, middle-class white people get that in their absolute prime of their taxpaying lives, which is why, you know, as a disease, you know, and it's, it's well-resourced. But at the same time, if you have to invest a significant amount of your what otherwise would be your working week into keeping your body like alive and you know and functioning then that's time that you're not spending writing and i'll let somebody else talk now <laughs> yeah, there was something there was something that you said, Shakira, um, that um, that resonated with me, um, and it was I think it made me think of uh, a conversation that um, I was having in um, a panel with um, um, where Maxine Beniba Clark was a part of it, and um, she was talking about how um, for for black writers that she said, look, once you find a you know you just keep submitting, submit, submit, submit um, your pieces. Don't, don't stop doing it because um, 
the, you know, the people that are evaluating it, you want to be able to um, not be just that anomaly. You want almost a deluge of, um, of, of these riders uh, that, that people are gonna look and go, oh, you know, um, maybe I should be um, embracing this conversation. Um, and, and and including this in, and I I keep thinking about the importance of for for not just us as academics, but also um, uh, looking at ourselves as writers. We need, uh, as Rudine Sims Bishop talks about, books needing to be windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. And for us, not just you know, I we usually say this, or at least I usually say this for. Um, for pre-service teachers and teachers saying that we need to make sure that our children have books around them that are mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. Mirrors, um, you know, really mirroring the experiences that, that they have in their everyday uh, lives, but also sliding glass doors that open them up to imaginative spaces um, uh, and stretching that uh, uh, racial imaginary, um, uh, you know, the, the racial imagination, you know, that there's a possibility for me to be the protagonist in this story, in these lived experiences, but also, um, uh, you know, the, with the mirrors, windows, you know, mir windows being able to overlook um, and to see things from perspectives that you might not. But I think as academics, we also need to be able to see that. Right, that we also need to be able to see ourselves in these um, spaces and not feel like we're only the only one uh, having that conversation. That we, um, because it becomes lonely, and um, you know, and with journals, they are conversations, aren't they? Um, and you, you know, but who gets to have those conversations? You know, if it's like a conversation, a ballroom, you know, is it? Is it just this small little group of people that's having the, the most powerful conversation whereas other people are just talking to themselves in corners? And so there was something that you had said, Shakira, that just, it just resonated with me. And I was thinking that, you know, there are times that I struggle within the space of academia because I don't see myself. You know, I don't see the, the, the overlaps, the nuances, um, the, the accordion of possibilities, or as um, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas talks about that, that imagination, being able to see uh, with um, the, the range of possibilities. And, um, and sometimes I don't see that. And so therefore, I feel a sense of, of uh, I feel very hesitant um, sometimes to be able to propose um, things because I feel that maybe this is a, a leap that do I want to take it? I'm already marginalized in the space that I'm in. Do I want to, to take that leap because it is, you know, will someone catch me? Will I be a part of that, a chain of conversations? Um, and I don't know, it just, it just sort of, you were talking about all these things that are coming in and you're evaluating, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's like, but if you only see one black voice, you hear one black voice within that space, um, uh, you know, that we actually need to be able to hear more in order for us to take um, that opportunity, um, you know, to, 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 to see that accordion of possibilities. Um, I, I'd like to sort of take the give the floor to someone else. I don't know, Ruth, if you wanted to. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, framing about institutions and um, really thinking about Jessica's work as well. And um, a point that you made earlier and hopefully link it to something Tarika said as well. And I guess I was thinking about um, what it means to you know, you know why stories are so important, Denise, because um, they set the frame for how we think about things. And um, if I think about how we make space for multiple voices, uh, one of the things I'm really aware of is the kind of white fragility that I've experienced in academia around that. And I've got two kind of examples I wanted to share. Uh, nurses love to tell stories because that's, you know, th that's how we share our learning, you know, it's like it's all about telling stories. 
Um, but one of them was uh, I used to teach in a lecture theater of 220 students and they were nursing and osteopathy students and I used to teach communication. This is when there was space in the curriculum to actually talk about how we speak to people. N now there's no space at all. So you know, it's like a luxury. So um, I remember on this particular day in this very beautiful lecture theater in, in New Zealand, and I went, Kia ora tato, whakalofa lahi atu, bula vinaka, you know, malo uh, lele, and I said greetings in a whole bunch of languages. And then afterwards, this uh, young white cis male came up to me and he said, Bruce, I was really offended you didn't say hello, you know? And I said, you know, the entire lecture is in your language. All the terms through which we engage, all the schedules, the way we sit in, in, in the space, the way everything is structured is your culture. It's the dominant culture. Um, and, you know, this one tiny kind of acknowledgement of uh, different worlds and experiences in this room, you know, that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really struck by the ideas of windows and sliding glasses and mirrors, you know, that, that one opportunity to kind of open a world beyond your own was just seen as such a threat, you know. And then the second event happened in Australia and I was, um, I had a joint appointment uh, and I won't name the places, but with a community organization. And I organized this incredible forum where we had an indigenous speaker and then um, some people of color speaking. And then we had youth responding to, to them and, and everyone was a person of color. And I kind of organized this whole thing. And we got this most incredible feedback from people. It was like, oh gosh, you know, like to have these conversations has been so incredible. And there was one person that said, how come there weren't any white speakers? <laughs> you know, I felt really marginalized. And I'm like, hey, we spoke your language. You know, we were in your venue, we were, but, but I think this is the thing, you know, because um, that whole conversation around diversity and inclusion has become very present in, in, in institutions, particularly uh, universities and in health. And the thing that I remain um, uncomfortable with and I struggle with is what are we being included into? You know, did we set the parameters? So I'm, I'm very, very interested in this um, uh, conversation around decolonial politics, but then also the citational politics that Tarika, you referred to, you know, um, it has to be more than one of us. And so I'm very grateful for this conversation. Listening to you, Ruth, I'm reminded of Scott Morrison adding the Anzacs to his acknowledgement of country, you know, the other ancestors, the ones who went to Gallipoli, the ones, who, you know, and not that, of course, there are, there are indigenous Anzacs, there are, you know, Anzacs from all the many locations that were with migrants to Australia, but of course, they understood their it's understood as being a white myth and you know and and it's certainly they were fighting for a, a hegemonically white nation and so to add the Anzacs you can't you can't just acknowledge First Nations people in their own right you have to say oh and yes but let's not leave let, let's not forget about the Anzac myths while we're doing that you know I, I've started to give my gut response to that, which was a string of swear words, but I'll, I'll leave that. <laughs> Part of what I'm connecting with based on the experiences you've all shared, of which I'm very grateful for, is the various ways in which within our own work and also within our own sense of being, we are unsettling and interrogating and really disrupting whiteness and the intersections of whiteness with all of these uh, colonial assemblages. And in doing that, you know, what, at, at what risk and at, at what um, embodied and felt experience and subjectivity are we doing that? And, um, and that, that, that's something that I'm constantly thinking about as I am working alongside and engaging and organizing with some of my students on campus whose experiences because they are 
women of color, because they are Black and African American women, because they are Latinas, they are experiencing really in the flesh. And so uh, I love the, the, the metaphor of mirrors, windows, and sliding doors, because it also resonates very much with Anzal Dua's concept of bridging, of, of making these connections at the same time as we are building El Mundo Surdo, like another kind of world and imagining and doing all these radical possibilities. So two questions that came to my mind as I was um, connecting with your stories and experiences is how do we cultivate this radical resistance and imagination and possibility of unsettling whiteness in our work? What are the challenges and possibilities? What is the risk? But also what is the possible healing and connection and radical hope that comes with that? that we experience, but that others experience, we, we experience that with others too, um, because of the work that we do that is so relational. So I just wanted to offer that yeah. as, a, as a reflection. Yeah, thanks for that, Jessica. Like if I can add to, the, uh, just jump on that, what you're saying about, you know, the, the weight of the work, but also the healing possibilities of engaging in political creativity or doing research that's close to home. Like for me, when I started in academia, um, or yeah, when I started, I was sort of like leaving my history at the door, so to speak. Like I didn't know, you know, I come from a discipline of psychology, which is historically, you know, very, you know, traditional in, you know, again, it's got a strong commitment to empir uh, empiricism in a very narrow sense. And, but at the same time, there's always space, you know, I always knew there was elements, you know, for the subject, to, for the subject and creating subjective knowledge. But I didn't know how to bring my voice into that, my work. And when I was doing my PhD, and which is around Muslim women and diverse identities and diverse, you know, subjectivities, uh, uh, yeah, diverse experiences and subjectivities, I realized I couldn't write and I realized I couldn't speak because something was stopping me. And one of it was, you know, I was afraid of contributing to colonial representations of Muslims in Australia. And, you know, we've had a quite a bit, you know, a, a long run about, a long run of, you know, being bombarded with these colonial imageries of who we are. And my children, they formed their subjectivity in that space. You know, they were ra raised in, you know, yeah, after 9-11 or, you know, during that period. So, you know, it had a profound impact on them. Whereas my history, there was a lot more uh, issues around, you know, other ways of understanding racism, which was around ethnicity and uh, race, but not so much around Islam. So Islam became more prominent. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is, yeah, I had to uh, sort of go back and explore who I was and my relationship to my past and understanding my own oppression and my own privilege to understand and attend to other people's experiences because um, it was like you're leaving, leaving your history at the door you're almost silencing yourself and you're not giving yourself permission. So to speak and contribute. And I was thinking like, where does this come from? And, you know, it's that fragmentation and that colonial binary thinking about the Noa and the known and, you know, or fragmenting and looking at Muslim women into, into different components, you know, just assigning them a Muslim a religious identity and, you know, silencing all other complexity around who they were that you see in public and academic discourse as well. So it's like, how do I attend to this complexity? And I realized that it was going back and exploring myself and bringing my history into my work and claiming my voice and actually knowing that my experiences and what I, how I felt particularly and what I knew is valid and useful in and useful in my work. And so yeah, it helped me. And yeah, that's how I ended up with, with a lot of, uh, with the work of third world feminists, you know, and Chicana and, um, African-American, Black, Indigenous, feminist theorists, you know, and I found this pool of language and epistemologies and ways of thinking that sort of freed me up. And, and it was like you, when you were saying, Jessica, it was like, we can do this. I'm like, wow, we can do it. And so it, it really was, um, you know, it helped me not only in my work with my research, but also healing myself. And what that mean, what I mean by that is, you know, I always felt fragmented into these different categories and I didn't fit into categories and I didn't fit, you know, I'm Muslim with that sun veil in Australia. That means that you're not Muslim almost 
or not an authentic Muslim. But, you know, in my history, like being unveiled Muslim is very uh, normal, like it's no big deal. So, yeah, he just gave me the language to sort of bring that all these uh, separations and, you know, these um, binaries into, into talk, like to talk to one another and like sort of mend myself. So mend my, you know, different intersections of who I was, mend my voice with my academic work uh, and mend myself, which I always felt fragmented into these different categories and taking on different personas and different accents and different, not that I was really good at different accents, but different uh, uh, way of navigating different structures of power. And yeah, sort of, it was very healing and just listening to other women's stories and their uh, challenges. So, but it does come at a, at a cost when you're navigating your voice and your, uh, or you bring to fore, you know, looking at experiences and your history and the broad historical context in which we negotiate uh, identity and how we develop knowledges around that. You know, when I went into and other positions as I moved from, you know, my post, uh, my PhD and started working in the field around identity and belonging and working, you know, with white feminists, you know, I felt I came across white, white fragility and, uh, and even though my knowledge was welcomed and um, it was funny relationship to my to my voice and um, what I bought, it was valued, but at the same time, it had to be controlled and suppressed and it had to be uh, uh, split again from my voice. So my knowledge was valued, but my voice wasn't valued and there was a, I had to split it and uh, and like share my knowledge, but at the same time, not being really acknowledge or giving credit for what I bought and being tokenized in particular ways. Like for instance, you know, my name being used, you know, in particular ways to attract Muslim communities because, you know, by virtue of my name, it signifies something quite strong. And yeah, and then when you, and, but because you know the politics around identity and the politics around whiteness and, you know, you want to deconstruct it, you want to challenge it, you know, you you also become a threat to your colleagues or to your people that you're working with because you ask them to interrogate their epistemic, epistemic location and question, you know, that they don't actually come from neutrality and, and compassion is not enough. You know, you need to unpack your history and relationship to your communities that you work with and the knowledges that you produce. And unfortunately, you know, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's not always the case, but a lot of times people can be quite offended by that. So what that means is, you become a person that's angry, but but you're angry about race, but they just see you as angry. So it you it's very easy to go back into that problematic position. So even though I felt quite liberated, I found myself in that you know corner again that I was the problem. And by the very virtue of you know asking people to question or asking. Uh, people that I'm working with to question their relationship to the knowledge production and what they bring to community and how they engage with community. So it's, it, it is hard, it is hard work and it is, it takes its toll on your body and yeah, your work, like it's hard work. And do you think look, that by sort of problematizing that or you as angry, in some way sort of justifies um, marginalizing you further. So, you know, to not include you on in your voice in projects or, and then sort of justifies, you know, excluding your, you, but not your knowledge. Exactly. You yeah, you're completely right, Tarika. That's exactly what I experienced. Um, and I think it's also, you know, an ego defense mechanism, you know, going back to psych, you know, you go back to that. And it is a way of protecting the ego because there's fragility and there's not, you know, that we're not, people are not, you know, particularly that people that belong to the center, you know, I feel like, I feel like we have a privilege coming from plural identities that you can think from different angles and see that there isn't one ultimate truth. And you know that everything is partial and incomplete. So you're always checking yourself and thinking, all right, is this the way I'm thinking? Is this how others thinking? And when you speak, you know that you can silence people because you can see the complexities of the different experiences, you know, of the people, you know, of different, um, you know, for instance, around Muslim women. Every time I spoke in one way, I'm like, oh God, I need to attend to this because I'm silencing this. Or how do I attend to this history of this person? 
and you know as it intersects with you know how colonialism happened in their country and how they ended up in Australia so you know the complexity but you and you carry that work and you ask people to attend to that complexity um particularly when you're working on the lines of you know uh people that are, don't have that plural history or plural way of thinking to see that but then you know you're asked to contribute and not do and what that means is yeah racism is not out there racism is in the institution and it's in you and it's in you know people that are navigating projects as white bodies and white subjectivities and so when you do ask that per ask people to question who they are you know and you do it in a caring way i'm not you know it's i think it's important to create these bridges and connect with people but yeah you become the issue and you become silence and it's justified to uh, push you out or to reinforce, you know, how they're thinking and feeling. But really, that's what the, where the good, well, I won't say that, the good work happens. <laughs> that's when, you know, when you touch each other, not in a physical sense, but, you know, in a epistemic sense where you actually disrupt and, you know, you show something that you can see and it shifts that person and you build bridges to understand how you see and you know and develop knowledge together but it does require more robust egos and you know a willingness to disrupt and sit in discomfort listening to you Litvia made me think about the way in which Muslim female anger has shifted and been deployed and located by others in the years since 9-11 and if we take like because Muslim men angry Muslim men, similarly to angry black men, they're scary, they're terrorists, they're, you know, should probably be in preventative detention. And whereas, so I think communities often put forward women to be not just particularly just angry, but just assertive, because, because Muslim women were being located as being silent and uneducated and, and, um, and, oppressed so having Muslim women express some of that anger that was seen as more legitimate and more okay and also it counters stereotypes you know we're not just being trampled on that by our men we can go on national television and be angry whoa you know and 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 you know role model but then Isis jihadi bride and so Muslim female anger now is seen as being as problematic as scary as potentially dangerous as in need of discipline as Muslim male anger sorry just to put it in the most reductive terms I I, I um, I'm just um, I'm sitting with this idea of what you had shared about anger and it just made me think that um, when I'm direct within the context of um, just if even um, with the pandemic and having to use Zoom as a medium in which to communicate with students, it's very, very challenging uh, because the, the media and the, the various means of communication and meaning making that's taking place out there that how I'm framed as a black person from the US living in Australia, um, I'm having to, in my teaching, compete with that view that, that, that almost, um, that, you know, here people are seeing me in, I, I'm coming into their homes and I'm trying to teach to them, to them because we're all in our, our, our sanctuaries, right? Our homes, right? And, and I just keep thinking about this one student who said, we didn't want to ask something because we, we you know, you, you, you looked angry. And, and I said, I asked, could you clarify this for me? And the reason why I looked apparently angry was because, or that I sounded angry was because I actually said, I appreciate your question. And I had to go back to the video to look. I said, I appreciate your question, but we're going to be answering questions during the Q&A session. Um, uh, and, uh, but right now we're looking at this particular concept. 
but that was angry. Now, when my colleagues who happened to be all white um, uh, ended up saying things that were more pointed, they were praised. And, and I just keep going back to this sense of feeling the sense of erasure in, in who, <clears throat> in, in, in the things that I'm saying and sharing are being read in ways that um, it doesn't matter how I, I shift and change it, it's still going to be read in, in, in a way that, that, that I, can, I can't control because we all are living in this, you know, white, uh, you know, uh, uh, dominated white supremacist see, space, spaces. And, um, uh, and it's difficult because you feel the sense of being silenced. And, um, uh, but I do have, I think, as Jessica had shared, the sense of that radical hope, I guess, you know, I, I think it's deep inside, and sometimes it bubbles up. And, and it's there. And then at other days, it goes down. Um, and, and even people who I thought, um, uh, you know, within these institutions of, you know, within academia that I thought, oh, yes, you know, I'm, I've got the opportunity of those healing possibilities that people that we were talking about earlier, um, because I'm, I'm amongst my people that, that, um, you know, I might have had someone who was an academic that, you know, was talking to me that happened to be black. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness you're here. And then I realize that this person is a male and is actually looking at me as a female. And therefore this is what my position is. And so it, it just, I guess I'm just pondering about the roller coaster effect of this, that there are days that I feel like I'm on top of the world and that that um, my students are sharing things like you have opened up our minds. I'm, we're so excited about this, and um, that, and they're actually creating media that is that is beautifully diverse, that is truly inclusive. And then there are days, or actually, as in this week, <laughs> I get that same praise, and then later on in another um, uh, space, um, well, you know, you were just angry, angry. And I, I, have, I thought, gosh, I was actually just direct and I was showing boundaries. And so I just go back and forth with this and, and very often feel that sense of being an object and that it's not, um, I think, trying to compete with the media and when I say media, I'm not just talking about news media. Um, I'm talking about books. I'm talking about those children's books at the very beginning that our kids have been introduced to those ways of, this is how the world is. This is who can be Cinderella. Um, you know, and is Cinderella really who we really wanna be? Do we really wanna be, perhaps maybe we wanna be the paper bag princess. Okay, who who basically told the prince to stuff it at the end? Okay, um, and and those are just children's books. The the power of those those children's books. And I just keep thinking that I I'm I'm competing with that media, and it's it's in. But at the same time, in our conversation, collective conversation here, um, that we need to um, that it gives me hope. Hearing these narratives from everyone. It is truly a counter narrative in and of itself. Did you want to say something, Ruth? I was, I was yeah, say, it will start wrapping up soon. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, um, I, I was really struck by the ways in which um, we, knowing that there are differences between us, but the, the we that we're talking about uh, in some beautiful way. Um, are both, you know, hyper hyper visible and hypo visible, and uh, objectified at the same time. And I kind of wanted maybe to make a last comment, really, um, uh, around being at a conference many years ago, where I was the only person of color in a room, and there was a conversation about Foucault, and I was talking about Foucault and biopolitics, 
And in the middle of the whole room, the facilitator, who was a white cis woman from New Zealand said, and where are you from? And I said, excuse me? She said, where are you from? And I said, so I'm talking about Foucault and biopolitics and I'm the only person of color in this room and you want me to explain where I'm from when no one else has been asked that in the entire room. And so I kind of think, um, you know, one of the things I'm interested in is how do we shift um, from being objects to subjects? How do we um, perhaps name the kinds of um, violences and microaggressions that are happening in the moment? Um, sometimes which are difficult to name because we don't always have the language because, um, you know, I was thinking of your point, Lut, about the generational differences and, you know, how our subjectivities were formed. You know, I'm, I'm learning these skills that I think future generations, you know, they're, they're much faster, more adept than me with responding, but I'm trying to sort of jump on, you know, and name this stuff, but it's a muscle, this courage muscle. Yeah. Jessica, last thoughts or anybody else? I mean, I could add something, but yeah, others. When, when you talked about the muscle, Ruth, I immediately went to this, there's this image with a quote that some of my students have shared with me. And it says, um, your fist is the same size as, as your heart. Keep loving, mm -hmm. keep fighting. And so when I think of anger, I always think of love as well. Because if I'm angry, it's because I love my communities, my, my history, even the country that I'm in right now that's on fire. <laughs> and so I'm angry because I love and I feel so much. And so I, I always try to even interrogate, what do we mean by angry? I had a student once say, oh, you know, you're so passionate. You know, sometimes you get so angry. And like, well, you should too, because what we're talking about is not easy. And it's not, it, it's, it's colonialism, it's structural violence. So join me in that righteous anger. And so and I, we can I, only, I, I end with that. <laughs> and we can only critique what we're invested in, right? But this last point, I only have time to mention in a very token way. And also I'm still learning. But I think a lot of us are also revisiting what we mean by women. And we often assume that when we say that this is a panel for women, this is an event for women, that, um, that it means anyone who's not a cisgendered male. But I think we need, I have had like trans and non-binary um, people say that actually they don't feel that that's adequate. And, you know, and all the initials in the, uh, anyhow, but, as I said, I don't have time to address that. We don't have time to address that in any depth, but I did think I should at least flag it. And, and, and whether these, um, you know, hegemonic notions of identity are rooted in whiteness ourselves and whether addressing those is also part of addressing, you know, racial assumptions. Mm. Yeah, if I could just quickly uh, say something on that, like, yeah, so like women of color, like the way I've engaged with it and the way uh, it makes sense to me. And, you know, that's this is open for, you know, a lot of discussion and critique as well, uh, is like an umbrella, a political term to uh, bring together voices, you know, recognizing the complexity and the homogeneity and the commonality, differences in the commonality at the same time as a, as a, to bridge solidarity and come into conversation recognizing all these, you know, um, you know, experiences of women and non-binary women and, you know, who have, and we were all, you know, we all experienced race in different ways, but in a way that we've been racialized in a more oppressive sense. Um, yeah, coming to conversation together at the same time, you know, recognizing the complexities and differences with our history. And yeah, so that's to me, like, that's how it's, I understood when I picked when I come across this uh, way of thinking and literature, that's how it's used. Like the women of color, you know, like for, for instance, Chicana feminists, you know, often they're lesbian. Uh, 
you know, talk about race, racism, you know, and non-binaries. So it sort of captures that in the way I understand it. But, you know, a lot of people don't see it that way. And I know like in Colin's work, she talks about women of colour as women have come to consciousness about their oppression, not even just a category of, you know, race and gender. So it's used and picked up in different ways. Can I just add one more thing? I just want to say I end with a quote on my end. And that is, uh, it's again, Anzal Lewis quote, that it's only through the body, through pulling of the flesh, can the human soul be transformed. For images and words to have this transformative power, they must arise from the human body. Thanks a lot. Also, I just wanted to respond to something that, that Ruth summed up with before, um, just sort of around how we deal through the body and how our body sort of responds in these spaces to things like the, the microaggressions, the silences, the marginalising of, of our perspectives um, in academic spaces. And, and I was thinking about how, you know, recently on the agenda, um, white colleagues have been championing championing the, um, the need to decolonize the curriculum. And I've been you know, thinking, you know, that of course I'm committed to that. That's what my work has always been about. And um, so why do I have this kind of bodily response of feeling uh, really kind of um, silenced in that space? Um, I found my, my response to that uh, really interesting and I'm kind of, but what I do find really healing is coming into these spaces to kind of unpack my response and decompress. So I'm really grateful to, you know, our research is, is so, so varied and we come from such dis different disciplines, but I'm really kind of held in this space to have, and, you know, grateful for the possibility of these conversations. So that that's what I take away. And that's the hope that I have, <laughs> yeah. If I could just give a last thought, and I think in, in terms of that hope and that collective conversation, it makes me, um, I think as a literacy person, li literature person and literacy person, really um, um, wanting to uh, dabble into the speculative fiction and, and seeing myself in the future. Um, and so sort of this uh, sense of Afrotopia, um, where we can reimagine the future, that we can do this by, um, you know, leading by sharing, you know, through the collective, that in the collective, that, uh, that this can help us to reimagine our future. So I think um, uh, it's really been joyful engaging with you all uh, in this conversation, because I feel that I feel re reformed. <laughs>